זה שיר על נקודת סיכס, חלק תסבוב, סיכה על ויחי, סקנד סיכה. In this week's parsha, it's told about how Yosef brought his two children, Ephraim and Menashe, brought them to Yankim. That they should, Yankim should bench them, should bless them. So Yaakov put his right hand on Ephraim and his left hand on Menashe. When he saw that, Yosef said it wasn't good, but it looked bad in his eyes. Yosef told his father, no, Menashe is the first one, put your first hand on Menashe. What Yaakov had done is he had put his right hand on the younger son. Yosef had positioned them that the right, the older son would be at his father's right. Yaakov reversed it. And then when Yosef points out that actually Menashe is the older one, he should put his right hand on Menashe. His father tells him, Yaakov answers, Yodaiti bini Yodaiti, my son, I know. He too will be a great he too will be for a nation. However, his younger brother will be greater than him. And he blessed Ephraim using the word Ephraim before Menashe. So we have to understand, the fact that a firstborn gets a bigger blessing than the other children, that's because we know that a firstborn has a special um, prominence in comparison with the other children, with the other kids. So if Ephraim is greater in stature, the Menashe, why did Hashem make it that he was born second? Why wasn't he the first one? So from this we understand that even though Taka, the younger brother, is greater, but there is some kind of advantage of Menashe over Ephraim. You see this from, from Hashem. And because of that virtue, so Taka, he is the first one of Yosef. Yet, on the other hand, when it comes to the Brach of Yankev, you see that the fact that 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 Ephraim, that Menashe is the firstborn and higher than Ephraim doesn't count for Yaakov. There's some aspect that Yaakov's conveying here where Ephraim is higher than Menashe. And that's why he puts his right hand on Ephraim and he proceeds in his bracha to mention Ephraim before Menashe. Base. Another point. As we've spoken many times, so by Tzadikim, especially the forefathers and the tribes, the Shvatim, there's no, it's not possible to talk that they made a mistake, God forbid, Chas v'shal. Especially the things that they did that says in Teiras Emes, the Torah of truth. So those are for sure truthful things and eternal things. And since Torah also means Haira, teaching to us. So this is also an everlasting teaching for Yidin, for all the generations. So for this we understand that Yosef's Taina, what Yosef said, Father, Menashe is the Bukhari, put your right hand on Menashe. It wasn't because Yosef was mistaken in not realizing what his father realized that the younger brother Ephraim is actually greater than Menashe. No. Yosef saw what his father saw. Nonetheless, he held that Menashe is more virtuous. Menashe is the Bechayr. Hashem made him the Bechayr. And he felt that this means he should come before Ephraim. In other words, both things, both in the fact that Yosef held that Menashe is higher, and the fact that Yaakov held that Ephraim is higher, both of them are true, obviously. It's just that when you look at life from the perspective and the avoid, the way Hash, the, the service of Hashem of Yosef, so Menashe is higher. When you come from the perspective and the avoid of Hashem that Yaakov does, the Ephraim is higher. In other words, they're both true. From the standpoint of Ephraim, of Yosef's avoid, the Menashe is higher. The standpoint of Yaakov's avoid, the Ephraim is higher. And that's why we see that Taka, Yosef had two children. And the first one is Menashe. First one means that that's where the strength of the father is more expressed than in the other children. It's the first child. However, when it comes to Yaakov, so Yaakov says to Yosef, your two children are to me Ephraim and Menashe are like Reuven and Shimon. To me, and Yaakov is saying to me, and he puts Ephraim before Menashe. In other words, Ephraim is to Yaakov like Reuven is to Yaakov. Ephraim is to Yaakov like the firstborn. So there's obviously two different ways of looking Yaakov's way and Yosef's way. Gimel. The difference between Nash and Ephraim and also the connection how the 
advantage of Menashe is connected to Yasef. And the advantage of Ephraim is connected to Yaakov. We'll understand through understanding the difference in the two names. Both names, Menashe, what is the Torah says, Yasef gives the reason in the Torah why is Menashe called a Menashe. Kinashani Elikim, as Hashem has allowed me to forget, to remove myself from all my um, suffering and from my father's house. Ephraim is, because Hashem has allowed me, Hifrani, to be able to be prosperous, uh, fruitful in the land of my suffering. Both of them relate to the feeling that Yosef had elicited by the descent into Egypt. But each one actually accentuates a totally uh, opposite aspect. The Rebbe will explain. The name Menashe reminds Yosef that Hashem has made him be removed and ejected from his father's house. He's in a place which makes him forget his father's house. And what does that tell you? When you say, he calls his son Menashe because I, I'm in a place which makes me forget my father's house. This expresses his desire that he doesn't want to forget. He wants to be connected with his father's house. When you name your son because I'm forgetting my father's house, but, but you're always going to be calling your son Menashe. That means that this expresses his desire not to forget. So that underscores his connection with his father's house. Ephraim means Hashem has allowed me to be fruitful in the land of my suffering. That's a thankfulness to Hashem regarding the advantage, the added benefit of being here and the fruitfulness that can come only from being in Egypt. So one is more nostalgia. I don't want to forget my father's house. One is more, although again, the name is I've forgotten my father's house. That's in order to remember not to forget. And the other one is not nostalgia, but rather recognizing the opportunity, recognizing the fruitfulness that Hashem has given me in this place that I am. So these two inyanim are related to the two ways we serve Hashem when we, when Yidin, generally the Jewish people are in Eretz Oni, in a land of exile. One way is that a person works hard and toils not to become affected by the environment. It, through what? Through being connected with base of you, with my father's house. The way things were before the descent, before the darkness, he's constantly reminding himself and reminiscing that right now this is not the way things should be. I'm in a place that's trying to make me forget my father's house. And when you're constantly reminding yourself that this is a place that makes you forget, so you remember not to forget. The second approach to being in exile is that he... He is now in a place of anguish, in a place of suffering. He's in a golos, in the darkness of the golos. To the extent he doesn't even remember so much, doesn't have such memories of his father's house, of the pristine, holy atmosphere represented by his father's house. But there, in the place of exile, he toils to try and illuminate the darkness of the exile with the light of Kedusha. And through that, there becomes an additional advantage that is born, that is granted to the one who's working hard, toiling in the place of darkness. It becomes, till it turns out that he becomes fruitful because of being in the place of suffering. Because what he's achieving there through being in that environment and working hard is achievable only there. This is the reason why Ephraim, it says, Ephraim was Yigdal Menu. Yes, you have both children will be great, but Ephraim will be greater than Menashe. Because the ultimate purpose, the ultimate uh, advantage, what is gained by going down into Egypt and into exile in general, is that Yerida Tzerech Aliyah descent is for the purpose of an ascent. And it has to be higher than the descent. Otherwise, if, if, if you go down in order to go back up if you get to the same level there's no that's not a good business deal you put in 100 to get out 100 so if the descent is in order to have an ascent it has to be at a higher place than where you started off from so in other words in, in put it in Menashe and Ephraim not just not to forget your father's house but to be able to come to some kind of an advantage through the descent of Golos 
And that's what Ephraim is. Ephraim, like in verse 1, you, Hashem, you made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. On the other hand, Menashe is the firstborn. Why is he the firstborn? Because when you talk about birth and revelation, in other words, when you talk about active and revealed service of Hashem, Menashe has to come first. Before you can achieve something transformational in the place of your, of, of your, of your suffering, you should be able to take your current situation of Golas and thrive in it, which is asay toiv, the avoid of doing good. First, you have to make sure that you shouldn't become contaminated by the darkness of the and affected by the darkness of the exile, and that's surma, staying away from negativity. How do you do that? Through always remembering where you come from, remembering base avi. However. That comes first because in the order of how you unpack what you're going to do, you have to make sure, hey, I got to put up my defenses, not get affected by the, not get pulled down by the darkness. And now, I'm strong, I can go and enter the darkness and transform it. However, so that's why Menashe comes first, because first you have to protect. Remember your father's house and make sure not to get, uh, uh, not to get affected by the descent, by the movement away from it. However, since the Kavvona, the purpose and the intent of going into the Golas is to have an ascent higher. So that's why the purpose is, in other words, Ephraim, to flourish in the land of exile. That's why in the Bracha of Yaakov, Bracha means, what does Bracha mean? Bracha means giving the power, the potential. Uh, the potential from above when going into Golas. The, the, in, already in, in potential, Ephraim comes first. Ephraim is the reason for this whole descent. So we talk about the bracha and giving the, the giving the energy to fulfill potential, so the potential is is visibly higher in Yaakov's mind the way he's giving a bracha, in Yosef's mind the way things are actually coming and unpacking. First, you need the remembering of the father's house, like Menashe. Hey, a deeper explanation of this when we talk about the advantage of what happens when a yid through his avayda what happens when a yid goes into the darkness of the galos there's few a few in yon. first of all the descent elicits and arouses within the person the strength of his neshama not to become affected by the darkness of the galos just like an opponent when somebody presents opposition it arouses within the person who's, a, who's being opposed the midas hanitzochen the, the competitive streak the victorious streak. He wants to win. The winning, the winning, the winning uh, uh, victory attribute. As it says, Davin Amel says, my soul thirsts for you. Why? Because I'm in a dark, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a uh, dry land. And then the way the Baal Shem Tev taught this Pasuk, Halavai, I wish I should feel this way when I'm in a holy place. When I see you in holiness, I wish I have this thirst that I have when I'm in a place of thirst. So in other words, the, the challenge of thirst brings out a very strong desire to overcome that. It brings out a place of, of a barren place where it elicits a thirst within a person. When there's an opponent, it elicits this strong desire, a, a victory streak that wants to do everything it can to be victorious. So the darkness elicits a higher power to emanate from the Neshama. Number two, deeper than this, through the descent, the great descent, when, when we, not just, it's not just descent, when there's a Yerida Gedele, a great descent, so that brings out an even deeper strength of the Neshama, because that the Neshama has no boundaries. And because it has no boundaries, it has the potential not just to stay unaffected and complete and untainted in the Golos. No, more than that. It's able to affect the surroundings and bring up the otherwise dark area to its level of light, to the extent where it can transform dark to light. But this is only the way the neshama is. These advantages are only the way the neshama is from itself. This advantage, which is in the neshama, it becomes revealed through the Aveda and Golos. But these things are in the neshama. It's just that the opposition that Golos presents elicits and uncovers these things, makes them active in the neshama. We've got to win. However, there's something else that happens in the neshama when it encounters the darkness of Golos. What's the higher thing? Gimel. Through the fact that you transform the darkness of Golos into light. So then what becomes achieved in the neshama is an advantage which the neshama didn't have on its own. It's not just 
uncovering or eliciting or pulling out something it had, it's creating something new, which is like a Baltshuva, which now has mitzvahs from the sin. Zochiyes, his dainis, his willful transgressions, if he does it deep enough to shuva, become like zochis, become like mitzvahs. A tzaddik doesn't have that. A tzaddik, he didn't do any zedanis, didn't do any willful averis. The um, a person who's about, who's about shuva, so he does, he did things that were averis, and perhaps he did them willingly. But then when his soul gets so thirsty, the darkness now get transformed. So now this, this neshama of the Baal Teshuvah who's come back to Hashem, he has things that were not in his neshama before. What does he have? He has those negative things that have been transformed into positive. So now we'll understand about Menashe and Ephraim as well. Um, and the Rebbe says in R22, this is really by every person. Because... Largely, the Rebbe in the actual Sikha spoke about the, the Zedonis, the Averis that turn into Mitzvahs. Well, that requires somebody to have done Averis. He says, really, every person, just by virtue of the fact that he has two souls in him, the animal soul and the godly soul, the purpose is that the godly soul should convince the animal soul to join forces. Instead of wanting physical desires, gluttonous desires, it should desire Hashem. When it does that, what happens is, that you have now an animal soul which has more power and more and more gusto joining with the nefesh of the kids with the godly soul to want god so that's also creating something new that wasn't in the neshama on its own it's bringing the power of the animal the animal soul Vav, through this we'll understand the difference between Rosh and Ephraim both are children of Yosef and both therefore express the concept of Yosef. What is Yosef called Yosef? Yosef is called Yosef because Ad. What is Rochel um, Yosef is born? Yosef Hashem li beinach. Hashem should add me another son. In other words, what do we learn here? The word Acher means other, non-holy. In other words, there's an addition here. What's the addition? Through working in Golos, like Yosef did in Mitzrayim, you transform the Acher, the other which is Sitra Acher, the other side, negativity, and it becomes a Ben. Yesav Hashem li Ben Acher, the Acher, whose other, in other words, unholiness, becomes transformed into being a child. But there's two levels in that transformation. Menashe is the strength of remembering the father's house. This represents the strength of the Neshama that was exposed by Yesav through his work in Egypt. Ephraim is... A, an indication of the additional light that becomes drawn down from the darkness itself. Hashem has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So what's higher? In other words, Menashe means that, yes, the darkness has brought out within me the strength that is in my neshama. Ephraim means the darkness has given me a chance to bring something new to the table to actually make it become fruitful in that environment, transform the darkness. And bring that darkness into light. So which is higher? It's obvious that the higher thing is when darkness turns to light. That's why Ephraim is higher than Menashe. But then it becomes difficult to understand. A Zion, it becomes difficult to understand why Yosef seems to be more connected to Menashe and Yaakov to Ephraim. It should be the opposite. Menashe that comes because of remembering the father's house. Sorry, Menashe. Yeah. Menashe is about remembering Beis Avi, my father's house. So it should be more connected to the father, Yaakov. Ephraim is that Hashem has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. I mean, that you would think is Yosef, because Yosef, his Aved is to add, like Yosef Hashem li ben Acher, to transform the Acher, the other, into son. So that would be Ephraim. So why does Yaakov seem to have an affinity for Ephraim and Yosef for Menashe? So we'll understand this by first explaining the Apostle, which says, Yaakov says, now you're two children that were born to you in Egypt. Before I came down to Egypt, they are mine. Ephraim and Menashe, and they will be like Reuben and Shimon. And here we have to understand what's not understood. L'chaira, he could have just said it a shorter version of the Pasuk. And now your two children, Ephraim and Menashe, will be to me like Reuben and Shimon. In other words, they're getting status. They're getting tribe status. Even though really they should be the tribe of Yosef. Should only be one. No, but Yosef is not... And a tribe in its own. On the contrary, he becomes two tribes, Menashe and Ephraim. They have status just like Reuven and Shimon. 
Well, why does he have to insert this lengthy introduction saying these two children that were born to you in Egypt before I came to Egypt? What does that insertion help? Yeshlevi could say that that's not just an, a, a, a giving a simon. It's not just giving the uh, the uh, so to speak the, the geography or no the the the, the biography the chronology. These two sons were born to you in Egypt before I came. No. This is also an explanation why these two children are specially connected to Yaakov. Why Lehem? Why they're so connected to Yaakov? Why? Because because of this, that they were born to Yosef in Egypt, and even more so, before I came down to Egypt, ah, that's why they're mine. Because the Pashtos, through the fact, simply speaking, the fact that they were born in Egypt, and they were raised in Egypt, where Yaakov wasn't before he came to Egypt. And nonetheless, they conducted themselves like Yaakov's grandchildren. And Yaakov says, these are mine. In other words, here becomes expressed the proper completion, the complete expression of Yaakov becomes expressed where? In the grandchildren that are born and raised before he even comes there. And they're born and raised like him. They're following in his footsteps. Ches. According to this, we'll understand why Davke in this Indian, Yaakov said Ephraim first before Menashe. Because Menashe shows, Menashe is an indication, the name Menashe and the, the terminology, the Aveda represented by Menashe, it indicates how the memory of the father's house was never forgotten. So that means to say that in, in a certain sense, it's not that these kids w- were raised before Yaakov came, because Yosef never forgot. So the, the, the impression of Yaakov is always there very visibly. When do you have the true concept of something, of, of that integrity being maintained before Yaakov comes to Egypt? That's when Ephraim, because Ephraim represents the understanding that you're already in the land of your affliction, the land of the suffering. And Bechitzen is externally, the connection with Yaakov is no longer felt, it's faded. And nonetheless, even when that's not there in a revealed way, and you feel being in a land of, 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 of suffering, nonetheless, Ephraim represents that they still serve Hashem in a way of Yaakov. That's really the great advantage. So if Yaakov says, Ephraim, before Menashe, because that's really an indication that my life, my life mission has been vindicated they're really living, my grandchildren are living my way of life even before I came and even not being affected by me. Ah. So this is a full expression of really lihem their mind. Test. Explain to Chesidus that Yaakov represents midas or emes, the concept of truth, the attribute of truth. What is truth? Truth goes from one extreme to the other extreme. It's true in every level. From the highest kotze extreme to the lowest kotze extreme. And who actually achieves this um, this uh, uh, truth that goes through all levels? This is Yosef. Because Yaakov, his level, the way he is in himself, his level is representative of being in Atzilus, higher than the worlds of Bria, Yitzhira, see the worlds of creation, formation, and, and action. And it's Yosef who brings down the level of Yaakov, of Atzilus, into the worlds of Bria, Yitzhira, Siyah. Till even to this lowest world, the lowest possible point from furthest away from the highest possible point. And that's really the inner reason that, Ye- that the descent to Egypt came about. Yaakov's descent to Egypt came about through Yosef. Because what ya- Yosef represents the worlds of deed, Yaakov is at Silos, but ya- Yosef is really pulling down and continuing Yaakov's service but bringing it down all the way to the lower worlds and that's also got to do with the highest point why because dafka when you transform the darkness to light when you make the bane into an acher that's when the advantage you have the advantage of the light that comes from darkness which is even higher than atzilus so it's even higher than the level of yaakov in and of himself but what 
through Yaakov's son that pulls it down here, down to the worlds of deed, and they encounter darkness and they transform the darkness, we now have that same truth expressing itself in even higher than Atzillus. So then, we, according to this, we could also explain why the 17 years that Yaakov was in Egypt were the best years of his life. Vayichi Yaakov, it says, Yaakov lived in Egypt, the best years, lived 17 years. Because Dafka, through going down to Egypt, he came to his top, he came to his to his complete state. Because by having it pulled down into the darkness and breaking and transforming the darkness, you have the truth going all the way down. And because of the great advantage of turning darkness into light, it also goes all the way up. Yud. Since Ephraim and Menashe are taking the place of Yosef in the count of Shvatim, Yosef isn't counted, now he's counted as two, Menashe and Ephraim. So we understand that they are a me'ain, a, 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 a somewhat a child of Yaakov. They're like Yosef, but split into two. What's the Indian of Yosef? He said it's to bring down this concept of Yaakov into Egypt. And here, the fact that it's Menashe Ephraim, not Yosef, there's an advantage. Why? By Yosef, even when he comes down into Egypt, still Yaakov's light and energy is felt in Yosef. In other words, the Atzillus is felt in Yosef's descent into Biyah, in a revealed way. And that's why the uh, there's really the darkness and the concealment of Egypt doesn't really have any control, any power over him. On the contrary, who rules Egypt? Yosef rules Egypt. So he's in Egypt, but because the spirit of Yaakov shines through him in a revealed way, that's Atzillus shining into this, this world of action, nothing can, can really control that, can be on top of that. So Yosef controls Egypt. So what it means that what that means is that when we're talking about the Aveda of Yosef, this wasn't the true descent into Egypt in Yosef's generation. Where does it really become pulled down into the into, into the darkness, the way the darkness opposes Kedusha, that's through the two children. Just like it was in square brackets, just like it was in Pashtus, and simply speaking. So long as Yosef was alive, they couldn't make any, any they didn't make any decrees on the Jews. They weren't in servitude. It's as if they didn't really descend yet into the Egypt of Egypt that later became their, 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 their prison. Only when Yosef died, it's as if that day they entered into the Egypt that we know is, is, is restrictive Egypt. But through the truth, so when Yosef was around, it was like the Atzillus was still shining. Dafka, the two kids that are in Egypt before I come to Egypt, before Yaakov says, before I've come to Egypt. In other words, the Avoid is in a place where Yaakov's light isn't shining. In the darkness of Egypt, which opposes Kedusha, oh, that's where you have what Yosef had started to do to bring forth and pull down the, the level of Yaakov into Egypt, which is, this is the completion of Yaakov, the Emes, which goes from top to bottom and is true in all levels. Yud Aleph 11. The three things we said before, these three things, Yaakov, the way he is before he comes to Egypt, higher than Egypt. Yosef, the way he is in Egypt, but still with the shine of Yaakov shining through him. And the third thing, the children of Yosef, which go into the darkness of Egypt, the way darkness, the way it is, the way the darkness really is, these three categories are can be lined up with the three things we discussed before. The advantage that happens through going down into Golis. In the first concept that we said that the strength of the Neshama is so strong that nothing can make it go down so the darkness just brings out the strength. No, I won't yield to that darkness. So it comes out that really there's some kind of a partition. And the, the, really the, um, the light hasn't really gone to the darkness. It hasn't gone into the exile. Just like Yaakov, who really never went into exile. Second thing is, he's higher than going down to teach him. The second concept where we said that compared to the strength of the neshama, the power of the neshama, there can't really be anything opposing it. And therefore, the darkness of the gullus becomes transformed into light. So that's like Yosef. Which Yosef goes into Egypt, but he really remains in control of Egypt because the level of Yaakov gets drawn down into Egypt, but because there's such a strong revelation of Atzillus, so the darkness has no chance to get transformed, even in Egypt. And then there's this third level where the advantage of the light that becomes drawn from the darkness. The darkness itself gets transformed. That becomes mainly through the Aveda in the darkness of Egypt. 
where the achievement and the hashpah of Yaakov is not felt, through the children, the five menashe, that are born in Egypt, as Yaakov says, Ad ba'ilech, before I came down there. According to this, we'll also understand the connection of Menashe to Yosef and Ephraim to Yaakov. Why? Because since the Indian of Menashe is to express and reveal the memory and the the, the feeling, the current of my father's house, and through that to transform the darkness of Egypt. So that's a little bit like Yosef, who's bringing down Yaakov's level into Biyah, but through that it becomes transformed. And Yosef doesn't really go into the Egypt the way it's restrictive. But the completion of Yaakov really is in the advantage of the light impacting and transforming the darkness. The darkness itself gets transformed. That's expressed by Ephraim. Ephraim Elikim Beretz Oni. In other words, um, in other words, Yosef Yeah, Yosef, Menashe was like the expression of Yosef. There's a light shining. I remember the father's house, and that's enough power. Yosef, the way he's connected to Yaakov, is enough power to push away the darkness. Transforms the darkness. But then there's a place which is Ephraim, that the connection of the Kedusha is not felt. But there's so... The Yaakov's level is pulled down into that place that in the darkness itself it can be transformed into light. I need to clarify these last two paragraphs because we're saying that Yosef, there is a sapcha that happens, there is a transformation that happens through Yosef going to Egypt, but it's a transformation that's still coming as a direct uh, result of the attachment to the strong light. The transformation that happens through Ephraim is happening where that light is not, that connection of light is not felt, but there's, what's required is an even and deeper uh, power to be able to reveal in the darkness that that true really, that too really is transformable to light. And that is then going to expose that it comes from a deeper place. Yud Gimel. Yidin are called... The name of Yosef it says Noyeh Katzein Yosef. That Yosef is considered like the separate, the shepherd of the entire Jewish people. Why? Because he gave us food, and so he kept the whole people alive. But from this, we understand that by every Jew, there has to be the concepts of Yosef, the two children of Yosef, Menashe and Ephraim. So, what does this mean in our Avedis Hashem? First and foremost, a Yid has to wish himself and desire to be part of his father's house. He wants to be in a situation that's higher than Golos. The fact that he has to lower himself into the into the um, obscuring of world, into the, the hiddenness of Hashem, which is the way the world is. And why does he have to go into this world which hides Hashem? In order to be able to refine the world, right? In order to, um, to refine the world and refine the exile. The feeling he has to have is <clears throat> that he's forced. Hashem's forcing him to go do it. And of course, he has to do what Hashem wants. But the, what happens is when you feel that you're forced to go do something, the moment that Hashem's not telling you anymore, go out there into the darkness and, 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 and transform the darkness. The moment you don't have to be in that exile place where Hashem sent you, right away you run away. Run away to a place where you can consciously and revealedly be connected with Hashem in, in a holy place in Tehra Aveda. On the other hand... So you go just on that shlichus for the moments and the hours or the days or the years, whatever it is needed, the moment that that is released, whoop, back to the place where you really belong, the place of Teira and Aveda. At the other hand, you also have to know that so long as your shlichus is to be in Golos, you're not allowed to just be like Menashe and be connected and, and wanting to run away and just do what's needed to make sure that you don't forget your father's house and not to get affected by the environment. That's Menashe, no. This Aveda is a preparation to the true intention of the Aveda, which is that there should be a fruitfulness in the land of suffering. Illuminate the darkness through doing mitzvahs and learning Torah. Transform the darkness, the darkness should become light. And it says when Mashiach comes, Laila Kayamir, the darkness will be illuminated like light. The night will illuminate like darkness, like the 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 night, the Laila, night, Kayemir will be illuminated like day. 
So really, this this Aveda is the, that I was saying here is has to be two things pulling at us. On the one hand, you have to feel that oh, I wish I could just be basking in kedusha and learning Torah all the time, but I have to go out there and do what needs to be done. So you go and do that, but because there's a feeling of always being connected back and wanting to be in an atmosphere of kedusha, so the moment you don't have to be there in a non kedusha atmosphere, run back. And then there's another thing that is that you have to, David of Ephraim, is you have to see the, 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 the true intention of being in that atmosphere of not Kedusha. It's in order to transform that atmosphere, to learn Torah there, the mitzvahs there. And you have a chance not just not to fall and be disconnected from your father's home, but actually to create something that is the deeper intention of Hashem, and that's to create, the, transform the darkness of your gullus into light. That's Lacha.